we are live sir greetings to all those present my name is ankit malhotra i am the co-founder and president of the jindal society of international law and it is my pleasure and an honor to have amongst us leading scholar and expert on international investment law but before i introduce him i'd like to share a few words about the jindal society of international law which started as a student initiative in the november month of 2020 it was launched on the 18th day of November by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University. The Society and its launch was also supported by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, our faculty coordinator and uh, strong well-wisher, Professor Dr. Weston Lepowski, and a dear friend of the Society and also the Center, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The purpose of this society is to increase the student engagement and interaction with international law through its various initiatives. Rather than being primarily research driven, we try to focus and offer skills based on the contributions towards international law. The society attempts to bridge and expand on this knowledge frame and, and streamline the studies of international law through experts of international law. The Spring Lecture Series of 2022, entitled The Colloquium on Challenges to Global Governance and Humanities in the 21st Century, offers a compendium of scholars from the Academy and professional experts from the Bar. Over the past years, the Jindal Society of International Law has hosted over 100 renowned speakers from foreign universities, members of the International Law Commission, international law firms, United Nations, the Hague Academy on International Law, World Bank, and the International Institute of Law. Through our previous series, we endeavored to study the law through the different contours and through its speakers who covered various aspects of the law based on the years of ex expertise and studies. Given the vast ecosystem and the engagement of international law in it, the society aimed to study the fragmentation and fertilization of various disciplines in the ecosystem of public and private international law. Over the years, the society has thus become a quorum of thought-provoking discussions due to the engagement of international law experts. Thus, as a result, through the spring lecture series, it is important to understand the law and its challenges from broader, different and differing vantage points. Acknowledging international law as a creation of states, it is also important to understand and appreciate the social sciences and humanities that have played an important role in shaping the law. Today amongst us to speak on the police powers, expropriation and international investment law, searching for coherence, we have Professor Dr. Rabash Ranjan, who's a the university's, university's part, and we're so grateful to him for taking our time for doing this. Professor Ranjan teaches and has published in the area of international investment law and international trade law. He was working as an associate professor at South Asian University, an international university established by the Sark Nations before joining Jinnah Global University. Professor, professor Ranjan has also worked as an associate professor at the National Law University, Jodhpur, and as an assistant professor at the National University of Juridic Juridical Sciences, Calcutta. He was also a visiting scholar at Brookings, India, and a visiting fellow at the Lotter Park Center for International Law, Cambridge University. He was a member of the team that drafted the 260th report of the Law Commission of India and on the 2015 draft model on India bilateral investment treaties. Recently, he was also invited by the Parliamentary Committee on external affairs to depose as an expert witness on India and international investment treaties. He has also authored a book, India and Bilateral Investment Treaties, Refusal, Acceptance and Backlash, published by the Oxford University Press. In his classes, Professor Ranjan, as I have been witness to, expounds and builds on these theories based on these three words, Refusal, Acceptance and Backlash. We are so grateful to him for taking out time to do this. Professor, the floor is, floor is now all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Anket. I'm extremely grateful to you for this kind invitation, grateful to the Jindal Society of International Law. Uh, it's an absolute honor to speak to you and to uh, all those who are, who are attending this lecture. Uh, thank you for the, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to see the progress that your society has made over the years. 
and uh, uh, you have invited so many wonderful speakers to speak on a wide variety of international law topics, which has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, coming to the subject that I'm going to present or speak on, so I'm going to talk about uh, expropriation uh, in international investment law with a focus on the doctrine of police powers. And my endeavor in, in, in this exercise is basically to critically assess the case law which has emerged through various investment treaty arbitration tribunals or the ISDS tribunals as they are famously called and to find out uh, how the ISDS tribunals have tried to apply the doctrine of police pass specifically vis-a-vis -vis, uh, determination of indirect expropriation. Uh, but before I come to come to the, the, the central argument of my paper, uh, I think it would be useful for me to give a brief introduction about uh, uh, international investment law and expropriation, uh, because I presume that everybody might not be familiar with this area of law. So when we talk about international investment law, uh, it is a very specialized branch of public international law which primarily focuses on the promotion and protection of foreign investment. Uh, the most important or dominant source of international investment law as we know today uh, are bilateral investment treaties or investment chapters that countries have put in the free trade agreements that they have signed. Uh, in addition to these treaties, you obviously have various customary international law principles, which obviously play a very important role just like they would do in any other area of public international law. Uh, now, if we look at bilateral investment treaties, uh, you know, the first modern bilateral investment treaty was signed in 1959. Uh, and since then, till date, uh, there are about, uh, you know, today we have about 3000 odd bilateral investment treaties. Uh, the most important purpose of the developed world to sign bilateral investment treaties with the developing world, especially uh, at the time when this entire treatification of international investment law started, uh, the most important or the dominant objective was to ensure that the foreign investment of the developed countries is safe, is protected in the territories of developing countries. Uh, and they wanted to bind developing countries to international law obligations. Uh, and the best way to do that was to enter into a binding treaty which would then bind the, the, the countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis the treatment of foreign investment. Now, in, this, uh, you know, in, in these investment treaties, there are several investment standards or there are several substantive standards that, uh, that are available uh, to ensure protection of foreign investment. Uh, a very important substantive standard that I'm going to focus today on is uh, expropriation. Uh, when we talk of expropriation, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the domestic law, for example, it is generally uh, uh, considered as synonymous to taking. Uh, but then this taking of private property can take two forms or can take two different or can, ha can happen in two different ways. Uh, the most common way in which uh, uh, private property can be taken is through direct expropriation. So for example, uh, acquiring the land, uh, that's an example of direct taking. Or in context of investment, uh, nationalizing a private investment, that would be an example of direct taking or direct expropriation. Uh, now, direct expropriation was quite common uh, in the 50s and 60s when newly uh, independent countries came, came to the fore. But over a period of time, direct expropriations have become rare. Uh, as countries have, have matured and have developed their regulatory capacities, uh, what has become important are instances of indirect expropriation. Now, I'll very briefly explain the concept of indirect expropriation, and then I'll come to the question of police parts. Now, when we talk about uh, indirect expropriation, it basically refers to a mechanism whereby the ownership of the investment hasn't changed hands. So the private investor continues to, or the foreign investor, if it's a foreign investment, continues to enjoy the fruits of the investment. 
continues to uh, you know have ownership over the investment yet the government has done something through exercising its sovereign right to regulate which has an effect uh, of direct expropriation so it has an effect equivalent of direct expropriation so just to give you a simple example let's assume that uh, that the government has given a license to a foreign investor to operate in a particular area and for whatever reason few years down the line the government decides to cancel or revoke that license uh, now once the license is taken away uh, the very basis of that particular economic activity to continue would come into question right so the investor will not be able to carry on with her business uh, and this would mean that the investor will not be able to enjoy the economic fruits or the economic benefits of the investment notwithstanding uh the legal ownership that the investor would continue to have over that investment so this would be typically an example of indirect expropriation now as the number of investment treaties have increased over the years so have the disputes between foreign investors and the state uh so for example if we if we look at the number of disputes that foreign investors had with states in early 1990s there were very very few disputes right exit which is a very important forum where these disputes are addressed or a very important institution where these disputes are addressed uh, did not get to hear uh, its first dispute for a very long time despite it being established in 1965 uh, it only became kind of popular or a common place for for investors to go only from 1990 onwards uh, and since 1990 still date as we speak there are more than 1000 uh, disputes involving foreign investors and the state now of course all of these disputes have not been decided in some instances uh, the disputes might have been settled uh, in some in some instances even if an arbitral award has been issued it is not available publicly so on and so forth uh, but this is the statistic given by the united nations conference on trade and development or uncat which tells us that about 1000 odd uh, investment disputes exist or you know have 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 come into existence involving foreign investors and the states under some bilateral investment treaty or some uh, investment chapter of fta now in many of these disputes uh, one of the central question or you know claim that the foreign investors have made pertains to expropriation of their investment so if we look at the cases that have that foreign investors have brought against states over the years we will find that foreign investors have challenged uh, a very wide array of sovereign regulatory measures of the state uh, saying that these these measures amount to expropriation so these measures could be for protection of public health for protection of environment pertaining to taxation policy related to monetary policy so on and so forth uh now in all these cases the central question that that the isds tribunals have tried to answer is whether this regulation that the state has enacted whether this regulation amounts to expropriation or not uh and in order to answer this question what is important is that the isds tribunal has to draw the line somewhere that okay if the regulation uh, crosses a particular threshold or a particular line then we can say that this amounts to indirect expropriation and how do you draw the line and where do you draw the line this has been a difficult question that several isds tribunals over the years have grappled with now this question becomes difficult for the simple reason that most investment treaties do not define expropriation so while they provide protection from expropriation uh barring certain instances for example if a state has expropriated investment uh for public purpose following due process and after paying compensation to the investor uh such expropriation will be lawful expropriation and it would not amount to a breach of the investment treaty uh but then as we would appreciate uh, uh in every instance of regulation the state would not like to give compensation to the investor for two reasons first if the state starts giving compensation to the investor for every single regulatory activity then that would make the the very business of regulation uh, very very expensive or impossible for the state second if the state uh, starts giving compensation to the investor then it would mean that the state is admitting 
that it has expropriated the investor's investment. Uh, the state would not, uh, you know, would obviously not admit that they have expropriated the investment because that uh, then sends out a very negative signal to foreign investors at large that, you know, their investment might get expropriated. So therefore, the state would merely argue that I'm only exercising my right to regulate, my sovereign right to regulate in order to achieve a public interest objective. This public interest objective could be protection of public health or achieving an environmental goal or, you know, some taxation objective, right? Uh, and, the, and, 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 and the argument of the state would be that this does not amount to expropriation. Whereas the investor, uh, if the investor feels the heat because of this regulation, uh, then the investor would definitely like to prove that this regulation breaches the line and it actually amounts to expropriation. So how do we draw the line and where do we draw the line? And uh, 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 this brings me to the core argument of my paper pertaining to police powers. Now, uh, the doctrine of police powers has been invariably used uh, in relation to issue of indirect expropriation uh, as a justification for non-payment of compensation when a foreign investment is adversely affected as a consequence of the host state's exercise of regulatory powers. Uh, so, for example, in a case known as Feldman versus Mexico, one of the earlier cases decided in international investment law, uh, the issue was whether imposition of certain taxes on the exportation of cigarettes by the claimant uh, amounts to expropriation or not. Uh, now, in this case, the tribunal said, and I quote, uh, governments must be free to act in the broader public interest through, through protection of the environment, new or modified tax regimes. The granting or withdrawal of government subsidies, reductions in or increases in tariff levels, Impose, imposition of zoning requirements and the like. So the so basically the tribunal said that as regards uh, the most important public interest objectives are concerned, the government should be free to act in that in that broader public interest. Now this in a way sowed the seeds of what in international law is known or has been known as the doctrine of police powers, and the most appropriate articulation or the most significant pronouncement of the police powers rule in international investment law was made in a case decided in 2004 known as Methanex versus United States. Uh, uh, this was in the context of, uh, of a public health measure that the, that the US government adopted. Uh, and, the, and this is what the tribunal said, and I quote, as a matter of general international law, a non-discriminatory regulation for a public purpose which is enacted in accordance with due process, which affects inter alia, a foreign investor or, or investment, is not deemed expropriatory and compensable unless specific commitments had been given by the regulating government to the then putative foreign investor contemplating investment that the government would refrain from such regulation. So the Methanex Tribunal basically said that the primary test for determining whether a measure amounts to expropriation or lawful non-compensable regulation depends on it being taken for a public purpose and in a non-discriminatory manner through a law enacted with due process. So if these requirements are satisfied, then that regulatory measure will not amount to expropriation according to this logic. The only exception, according to the tribunal, to this general rule is if specific commitments have been given by the host state that it would refrain from under, undertaking any such regulatory measure. So if the state has given any specific assurance to the investor that I will not adopt this kind of regulatory measure, and the state then goes back on this assurance and adopts that regulatory measure, only then such regulatory measures would amount to expropriation. Otherwise, if the regulatory measure is non-discriminatory, it is for a public purpose and it has been enacted following due process, then it would not amount to expropriation. Uh, uh, this is the articulation of the police powers rule in the Methanex case. Uh, there was another case following the Methanex case uh, uh, in 2006, uh, where the tribunal again tried to lay down the police powers rule and, 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 and it said 
It is now established in international law that states are not liable to pay compensation to a foreign investor when in the normal exercise of their regulatory powers, they adopt in a non-discriminatory manner bona fide regulations that are aimed at the general welfare. So uh, the, the Saluka tribunal, the Saluka versus Czech Republic, uh, the tribunal in this case, again, in a way reiterated uh, the police powers rule, which the Methanix tribunal had laid down. Now, uh, up to this point, all good, because you would argue that one should not have a problem with these, with these assertions. The tribunals are basically trying to protect the host state's right to regulate. Uh, but there are certain issues with these articulations and what they actually mean. And this is precisely what I have tried to try to analyze in my paper. Uh, uh, and I, I would like to basically discuss two sort of uh, issues which can be called as you know problems or you know it depends on how you put it. Uh, but there are two basic issues which 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 needs uh, a greater scrutiny. Uh, for example, uh, the first issue is that what kind of governmental actions would fall under the police powers doctrine? So, because you know, when we say that public interest measures for public interest, that's a very broad, you know, very uh, 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 a very broad way to say that all kinds of regulatory measures would satisfy the requirement. Uh, so therefore, the question is that when we talk of the police power doctrine, uh, what are the governmental actions that fall within the police powers doctrine? Now, if we look at the Methanex case or the Methanex rule, as I call it in my paper, the Methanex rule is that all governmental measures that are non-discriminatory which have been adopted for public purpose and implemented by following due process are part of the police powers doctrine and do not amount to expropriation. Now, if we use this rule to determine, uh, uh, then a very large range of governmental measures would fall within the, within the purview of police powers doctrine, right? Uh, because this rule is not indicating or is this rule is not pointing towards what kinds of governmental measures would fall? You know, uh, is it restricted to public health? Is it restricted to environment? Is it restricted to taxation? So on and so forth. It only says that if it is non-discriminatory following due process, uh, uh, then it would fall within the rubric of uh, the Methanix rule, that is the police powers rule. Now, my argument is that if we take this rule as the as the basis of the police powers doctrine and international investment law, then it would negate the very purpose of expropriation provisions and investment treaties. Because it's important conceptually to, to keep in mind that investment treaties do not prohibit states from expropriating. Uh, states can expropriate foreign investment provided certain conditions are satisfied. Now, to say that uh, if you expropriate or, you know, if you adopt a regulatory measure for public purpose, uh, following due process, which is non-discriminatory, then you're basically saying that there can never be an expropriation, right? Uh, and, 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 and most importantly, there is no focus or talk in this rule on the effect of that uh, governmental measure on foreign investment, right? There is no talk of that in the Methanix rule. So therefore, in my view, this is this is my criticism that in my view, this kind of uh, uh, negates the very purpose of having the expropriation provision uh, in the investment treaty. So when we are talking of a bona fide regulation, uh, let's assume which totally destroys the value of the investment. Uh, should there be compensation to the foreign investor? Or uh, should the foreign investor not be given any compensation just because it was a bona fide regulation, which was for public purpose and it was, you know, non-discriminatory and adopted in due adopted by following due process. Uh, now again, this is where you know in my title I say searching for for coherence because if you look at other arbitration rulings or arbitration tribunals, uh, they kind of indicate or suggest that. Uh, if a regulation completely destroys or substantially destroys the value of investment, then that 
cannot be merely regulation right uh, so for example uh, in a case uh, in a, in, a, in a case involving uh, azurix versus argentina this is what the tribunal said the host state is not liable for economic injury that is the consequence of bona fide regulation within the accepted police powers of the state uh, but in this case the tribunal again uh, did not emphasize upon what is the meaning of an economic injury because uh, even if the profits of the investor come down that can also qualify as an economic injury or even when there is substantial or total deprivation of the investment that would also qualify as economic injury so this remains uh, you know a, a, a difficult question when we come to identifying the uh, uh, what are the governmental measures that fall within the domain of police powers now outside the methanics rule attempts have been made to define which governmental actions fall under the police powers doctrine uh, uh, so for example if we look at the 1961 harvard draft convention on international responsibility of states uh it recognizes a number of categories in which non compensable taking uh, can take place uh these categories are taxation uh, general change in value of currency maintenance of public order health or morality uh, valid exercise of belligerent rights or normal operation of the laws of the state subject to certain conditions in the draft convention now of course you know this is this is this is just a draft convention it's not binding but 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 i'm you know in, in terms of norm creation and normatively what is the impact of this is something that we need to that we need to uh, focus on now based on this several other scholars have tried to uh, you know prepare their own list of what can you know what are the issues that can possi possibly fall within the doctrine of police powers uh, uh, but despite all of that i think uh, one can clearly say that as of today there is no taxonomy of governmental measures that will fall under the police powers doctrine so you know there is no consensus that okay uh, a b c d e these are the five items that would fall within the police powers doctrine uh, now my my critique or my question is that till you are able to decide which governmental actions would fall within the uh, you know would fall within the domain of the police powers doctrine it is very difficult to then apply it especially in the manner in which the methanex tribunal tried to do in this you know uh, 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 broad uh, manner saying that all regulatory measures which only satisfy a few characteristics would fall within the domain of police powers uh, another the, the saluka tribunal which actually reiterated the police powers doctrine given by uh, the methanex tribunal Uh, actually confirmed the indeterminate character of the police powers doctrine uh, the tribunal after reiterating the rule which i mentioned earlier uh, it said that international law is yet to identify comprehensively and definitely which regulations are permissible and will be accepted as falling within the police or the regulatory powers of the states uh, it emphasized the necessity to draw a bright an easily distinguishable line between non compensable regulations on the one hand uh, on the other measures that have the effect of depriving foreign investors of their investment and are thus unlawful and compensable in international law uh, the tribunal further said that it falls on the adjudicator to determine whether the concerned regulatory measure crosses the line that separates regulation from expropriation so if we take this argument then it basically means that the arbitration tribunal will have the discretion to determine whether a contestable regulatory measure uh, is part of police power of the state and hence a regulation or it is not part of the police powers of the state and hence it is expropriation uh, this discretion rests with the arbitration tribunal now this in my view gives uh too much discretion to arbitrators to decide complex value laden questions such as what are bona fide purposes and what are not for the state concerned right uh the state is not deciding the adjudicators will decide and of course the other attendant problems that we have that there is no appeal you know inconsistency in rulings lack of transparency all of that then complicates this entire thing of whether the arbitration tribunal should have this kind of freedom 
uh, so this is my first critique that you know uh, the the inability to identify which are the governmental measures that fall within the domain of the police powers doctrine uh now let me come to the second critique which i want to make uh and this is this pertains to the inconsistency in the application of the police powers doctrine by the isds tribunals so even if one were to agree assuming right uh, even if one were to agree on governmental acts which fall within the domain of police powers a more fundamental question is the extent to which this rule can be relied upon to argue that the regulation is non compensable uh, in other words how do we apply the police powers doctrine in cases pertaining to indirect expropriation so if a measure is well accepted to be part of the police powers doctrine so let's assume that there's a particular measure say you know when the pandemic hit us most scholars started to say that public health clearly is part of the state's police powers uh and and i guess today that the, the the environment is such that nobody will argue that that public health is not part of state's police powers although uh, before the pandemic such arguments could have been made but today such arguments will not be made i mean no scholar will make that argument today now so let's assume that the state has enacted a public health regulatory measure and it is claiming that this is part of its police powers uh, you know its police powers now uh, the question would be that even if we have settled that okay this is part of police powers the question would be how would you apply this uh, in 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 you know in determining whether it amounts to expropriation or not uh, in other words that if a measure is well accepted to be part of the police powers doctrine and applied for a public purpose in a non discriminatory manner following due process let's assume that all those boxes are ticked which methnex rule has laid down Uh, it results in substantial deprivation of foreign investment will that uh, regulation be expropriatory uh, now in order to answer this question first we uh, you know first we will have to look at the cases where the approach was that measures falling under police powers doctrine do not amount to expropriation even when these measures result in substantial deprivation of foreign investment this is one line of cases and this is precisely what the saluka tribunal said that irrespective of the impact or the effect that the governmental measure has on foreign investment it will not amount to expropriation uh, uh to the contrary there are some other cases where the tribunals have recognized that the police powers doctrine is not absolute Uh, it is subjected to some kind of effects test which means uh, assessing what has been the effect of the regulatory measure on foreign investment uh, and then determining whether that particular regulation of the state results into expropriation or not so if one applies the the methnex test or the you know the methnex rule as i said then uh, you know uh, uh, one does not get a clear answer because the methnex uh, rule does not talk about the effect or does not talk focus on the effect of uh, uh, you know regulatory measure on everybody whereas when we talk about the saluka case uh, or if we take the saluka rule then the salu according to the saluka rule even if the regulatory measure let's assume a public health regulatory measure and let's take a live example that you know many countries impose very severe lockdowns in order to stop the spread of the pandemic now let us assume that because of this lockdown certain foreign investments were substantially destroyed there could be right it depends on the nature of the investment uh, and also depends on the severity of the lockdown uh, that that certain foreign investments were substantially deprived or substantially you know destroyed now the question would be that whether this public health regulatory measure amounts to expropriation if you apply the methnex rule you will not get a clear answer if you apply the saluka rule you will get a clear answer and the clear answer will be that no it does not amount to expropriation because it is a, a public health measure which squarely falls within police powers doctrine and uh, the effect notwithstanding the effect it will not amount to expropriation uh, but all tribunals don't kind of follow this line of reasoning and that is where you know the the search for coherence comes in uh, there are some tribunals 
uh, which have said that uh, we will we will look at this 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 police pass rule but we will subject this to an effects test so for example you know uh, i'll i'll try to illustrate this point by taking examples of taxation now just like uh, you know acting for public health is considered to be part of the state's police pass likewise taxation measures have historically been considered to be an integral part of the uh, sovereignty of the state right this was one of the reasons why india was up in arms in both the vodafone and kane cases that you know this this pertains to taxation and that is our sovereign right and no tribunal or you know no treaty can take away that right from us uh, uh, but then you know when we look at the the manner in which isds tribunals have addressed this core police pass uh, uh, governmental action that is taxation we will find that the arbitration tribunals have not been so differential to the state as the states would like they have been differential to the state on 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 taxation matters but they have not been completely differential to the state uh, so for example uh, uh, let me let, let me talk about this case known as encana versus ecuador where the tribunal basically said uh, that if a taxation measure or if a taxation law is extraordinary or punitive in amount a claim of indirect expropriation can be made right so this you can see clearly contradicts the line of reasoning uh, uh, that we get from the saluka line of cases so the saluka case said notwithstanding the effect it will not be expropriation whereas here we have encana versus ecuador talking of taxation measures saying that which is as i said undoubtedly no 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 one will contest that taxation is not part of state's police pass uh, uh, but the tribunal saying that if the taxation measure is extraordinary or punitive in amount then there can be a claim of indirect ex expropriation on the same line in another case known as burlington versus ecuador uh, the tribunal observed that confiscatory taxation constitutes an expropriation without compensation and is unlawful so uh, from these two examples which i have just given to you it is very obvious that if there are taxation measures which are punitive you know which are extraordinary which are disproportionate for example then that can lead to claim of expropriation uh, so so if we accept this line of argument then it it's obviously contradictory to what methanex and saluka has said and this is where the inconsistency of arbitration tribunals comes in uh on the other hand there have been some other arbitration tribunals which have basically said that the applicability of the police pass doctrine is subject to the principle of proportionality or is subject to a proportionality review uh, uh in other words the tribunals have said that measures falling under the police pass doctrine uh do not amount to expropriation if the adverse effect of the measure outweighs the public purpose it seeks to achieve so which means that let's assume it's a public health measure or a taxation measure okay fine it's part of the state's police pass but that on its own is not sufficient uh this will then be subjected to a proportionality review uh and only if the purpose uh you know outweighs the effect right only then it would amount to Uh, a lawful regulation and not expropriation so one of the first isds cases which kind of made an elaborate reference to the you know kind of elaborately talked about the proportionality review is a case known as tecmet versus mexico uh, and the tribunal in this case uh, referred to the principle of proportionality by citing the jurisprudence of the european court of human rights because you know the the, the proportionality principle has been developed and applied in the european court of human rights to the students uh, so the tecmet versus mexico tribunal basically borrowed the jurisprudence of european court of human rights to support the proportionality test in determination of uh, indirect expropriation the tribunal held that there must be a reasonable relationship of proportionality between the charge or weight imposed to the foreign investor and the aim sought to be realized by and by any expropriatory measure uh 
so this is proportionality stricto senso as we understand it. Uh, and the tribunal said that, okay, fine, if it's a regulatory measure, which is, which falls within the police pass uh, uh, bracket, say tax, say public health, etc. Then the next part that is not sufficient on its own, it will then be subjected to a proportionality review. Uh, another tribunal which has applied the proportionality review uh, is a tribunal known as LGNE versus Argentina. Uh, uh, and it also said that states have the power to adopt measures for attaining social and general welfare purposes. So it recognized the police pass doctrine. However, at the same time, the tribunal also held that such regulatory measures must be accepted without any imposition of liability, except in cases where the state's action is obviously disproportionate to the need being addressed. So it, it, it did not refer to the proportionality analysis in the same way as the TECMET tribunal did, but it referred to the proportionality analysis by bringing in this notion of obviously disproportionate to the need being addressed. Now, one can always quibble about what is the meaning of obviously disproportionate and things like that, that would require a separate uh, uh, seminar. But my point, my limited point by citing these cases is to show that this is a line of cases which is not accepting police pass doctrine or is accepting police pass doctrine but is subjecting it to further checks or further reviews, which is again different from what the Methanex and the Saluka tribunal did. Uh, of course, there are, you know, one can always look at other cases which would fall within these lines, uh, you know, within these buckets which I have talked about. For example, there's this case known as El Paso versus Argentina. Likewise, the Philip Morris versus Mexico or Philip Morris versus Uruguay case also talked about the police pass doctrine being subjected to a proportionality review. So uh, to, to, to quickly sum up, I know I have spoken for almost about 40, 40, 45 minutes, and I would like to have some time for questions and discussions. To quickly sum up, my core argument is that while the police pass rule definitely appears to be attractive in protecting the state's right to regulate. Uh, however, that on its own is not sufficient or still leaves several questions unanswered. Uh, for example, which are the governmental actions which fall within the domain of police pass? Uh, even if we are able to address this question, the second question that uh, 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 when we apply the police pass doctrine, do we apply it in the manner in which the Methanex and Saluka tribunal suggested, or do we apply it subject to other reviews and checks uh, of the kind that uh, TechMed or you know other tribunals have suggested? Now, uh, you you know one one can always argue that searching for coherence in a system which is fragmented, especially of international investment law is a futile exercise. Uh, uh, yes, it might be a futile exercise at one level, but nonetheless, uh, as lawyers, we all believe in the value of coherence and in the value of certain degree of predictability in how uh, uh, cases would be decided. Uh, and even if uh, we can't achieve 100% coherence, there has to be a certain degree of you know, uh, uh, a certain amount of coherence, which which would be useful, not just for the not just for the uh, uh, states, but also for the investors and all the stakeholders in the system. Uh, my final point is that as we speak, there are you know we now have entered into a new world of investment treaties, which are far more detailed than what we had earlier. Uh, these investment treaties contain or are trying to treatify the police pass rule. Uh, for example, the Indian model bit is a good example of this. Uh, and there are other examples as well. Uh, uh, in, 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 in my hope is that in the, in the coming years, we, this, this better drafting of the treaties would help in achieving a certain degree of coherence in the case law as well. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Ankit. And uh, I'll be happy to have questions or discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I, I encourage our participants to share their, their questions as well. But yeah, in, in the interim, let me just pose a few of, of mine. Uh, I, I tend to study the proportionality review with respect to the necessity view as well, as one, one, one sort of relates to this tortious claim. 
but but that only in reference to these concepts being studied together so i'd be interested to see how the aspect of necessity also initiates itself into the discussion my other 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 point which i would like to raise is that uh, public purpose seems a lot like public policy in the constitutional sense of how we understand it and uh, perhaps the retrospective application of it is as, as we've seen in the Indian cases which cause such 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 grievances is, is, is something which 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 sort of I seek your opinion also on and uh, uh, this then this becomes a discussion of a larger question of sovereignty as well in the international sphere because as you enter a treaty you shave off sovereignty but then then sovereignty remains as this this claim which which or this sort of protection which you use more often than on but then you initiate laws domestically to protect your sovereignty from these laws and 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 how far is this claim of this bona fide uh, or how how deep is this claim and uh, with respect to these uh, I'd be interested to know if there is a relation to the Sharvos case or the Jagumina uh, 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 factory case in terms of environmental protection and, and, and claims made with respect to that. So if there is some sort of a relation that one can draw from that, that case as well in the ICJ, uh, I'd be interested to know if there is a relation or some, some sort of a discussion which can be made on that respect as well. And uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. And I'll encourage our participants also to 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 share their their question in the chat box, which we can take up afterwards. Yeah, let me quickly respond to some of these points, uh, if I may. Yeah. So on the necessity issue, uh, Ankit, yes, when we are talking of the proportionality review, of course, necessity will be one of the steps. Uh, you know, it will be a three-pronged test. I mean, first is suitability, followed by necessity, and then proportionality, strictos, and so. But the manner in which arbitration tribunals have applied the proportionality review, they have not always followed uh, these three steps. So they have often jumped to proportionality, strictos, and so, even without answering the question whether the measure that has been adopted is necessary or not. Now, this, this obviously is problematic because then it means that even those measures which are not necessary are getting assessed on you know whether they achieve the objective or whether they have a greater adverse impact on the foreign investor. So this has been a critique of the, uh, uh, the functioning of the ISDS tribunals that they have basically skipped the necessity test or the necessity step and they have directly jumped to uh, uh, proportionality review, stricto sensor. And uh, I'd be also interested to know on on areas where there's no one's sovereignty exists, but are sort of these the areas such as such as the moon or the oceans above above uh, or beyond two hundred nautical miles with respect to investments made, or or with respect to some uh, uh, some sort of a some sort of a mission or a project undergoing in these areas. So if there is a claim that needs to be brought, then how does that work or, or how do states react to that? And then who goes for the claim? Is this sort of, there is this ergo omnis obligation which rests, but then have there been instances wherein this has become an important aspect which has been discussed? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there has been a case which has discussed something like this. Uh, but of course, if a case of this nature were to come up, uh, 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 you know, the question of jurisdiction will obviously have to be answered before one can go to the merits. And to answer a question of jurisdiction, unfortunately, the investment treaty, at least the first generation investment treaties will not be very helpful. So these questions will then have to be answered by applying general principles, or, you know, by, by, by applying the general international law that we know. Yeah. Uh Okay, we do have a hand raised. Uh, Ramit, uh, you can uh, wait. I'll have to give access for just a moment. Yeah. Can okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I quite had that background. Anyway, uh, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, professor, I was wondering how exactly do states distinguish between, say, the doctrine of necessity as a defense versus the use of police powers because I, I seem to think that there's a bit of overlap between the two of them so do they use these as do they raise 
separate claims under these headings or is one subsumed under the other? How does that work out? Yeah, so that's a good question. So police powers can be used as an exception uh, uh, as regards the claims for expropriation is concerned. Uh, whereas the doctrine of necessity can come in when you are trying to defend your, uh, you know, let's assume that it is proven that the state has breached one substantive obligation in the investment treaty, be it expropriation, be it fair and equitable treatment. Uh, and then, you know, the treaty might contain a general exception clause, for example, or what are known as the non-precluded measures provision, the NPM provision, which may contain uh, you know, uh, of which may kind of give the state the right to enact certain measures if it is necessary to achieve certain objectives. Mm -hmm. And those objectives could be public health or, you know, environment, etc. Now, in that context, the state can then raise the defense of necessity. Uh, 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 now, but again, uh, as I said earlier, while responding to Ankit's question, if the police pass test is subjected to a proportionality review, then a certain degree of necessity uh, you know, analysis would then become part of the police pass test as well. But the function that this test of necessity would perform will be different. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the expropriation case, it would be limited to only that expropriation claim. Whereas when that test of necessity is being applied in context of the general exception clause or the non-precluded measures clause, then it would apply to the entire treaty. It would apply to all the substantive standards. So, so that is where the difference would arise in terms of the functionality of the test of necessity. Uh, but yes, you are right that there might be a certain degree of overlap, especially when uh, you know we follow the TechMed reasoning of subjecting uh, police pass to the to the proportionality review. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I don't see another question in the chat box, and uh, I think uh, we, we can uh, close now. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for taking our time for, for doing this. We're so honored and, and privileged to have you amongst us, and we look forward to discussions and interactions in the near future as well on this very exciting and, and, and uh, fast, fastly growing subject of international law. Uh, Professor, final words and uh, final words from your end, and 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 then we can close. Uh, no, thank you very much for the opportunity once again, and uh, uh, I look forward to to more such opportunities in future. And good luck with all the great work that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your kind words, and I also want to thank our participants for joining this discussion. Uh, we're we're so honored and privileged to have everyone everyone here this uh, Friday evening. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. And thank you to our participants as well. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye-bye.